folks. Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to a Monday Watchman Newscast live stream. Hey, it's great to be back with you. You know, I was on the road last week. We were at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, Tennessee, NRB for short. It's a great annual event, really a gathering of the top uh, Christian media and broadcast outlets, filmmakers, podcasters from around the world, in particular here in the United States. But we had people from around the world converging on Nashville for this NRB convention. We were there, uh, our team here at TBN, promoting Stackelbeck Tonight. Now, that's my brand new show launching on TBN March 25th, twice per night, 7.30 and 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Stackelbeck tonight, Monday through Friday. So we had a great time promoting the show. We had a massive mural there uh, just showcasing what we have coming. It created a lot of buzz at the entrance to the exhibition hall. So that was a lot of fun in Nashville last week. I say all that to say that is why you didn't have any live streams last week we had a bunch of uh, content here that we posted here on the channel but no live streams well we're back we're starting the week i'm back here in dfw and we're starting the week with a live stream and we've got a lot to talk about folks a lot to catch up on number one hezbollah talk about the intensification of hezbollah and israel today how about this 60 hezbollah rockets 60 barraging israel's golan heights by the way I was just in the Golan Heights two weeks ago, and Israel taking out a major, another major Hezbollah commander as Hezbollah shoots down an Israeli drone. Uh, as you can tell, we've got a lot to discuss on that front, the northern front. Things are happening, folks, and the countdown continues to what I've called the Great Northern War that's coming, I'm sad to say, to Israel's north, but we're going to break that down also the Houthis, we've got the three H's, right? Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis. The Houthis disrupting communications, underwater cables, uh, traversing Europe into Asia. I mean, folks, it's bad enough that the Houthis have shut down a portion, essentially, of the Red Sea, one of the world's most vital waterways. But now targeting underwater communications cables, having a global effect this Iran-backed terror group operating out of war-torn Yemen. And the West seems absolutely handicapped and can't seem to do anything decisive about it. Yes, that U.S.-U.K. coalition has carried out airstrikes against Houthi targets, but clearly the Houthis have not gotten the memo because the attacks and the chaos continue. We'll break down this new development on the Houthi front as well. What about Gaza? Speaking of fronts, Kind of the initial front, right, that opened up on October 7th with that heinous genocidal massacre perpetrated by Hamas's demonic death cult. Well, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the final assault is coming on Rafah, which is Hamas's last stronghold in Gaza, bordering Egypt. And Netanyahu says when, not if, despite international pressure, when Israel takes out Hamas, takes down Hamas and Rafa, then his words, the war will basically be on its way to being over and Israel will be on the cusp of what he called total victory. So total victory is within sight and these ongoing hostage talks that we have right now in Paris right now, we have EU diplomats, US diplomats, Israeli, Qatari diplomats involved, all trying to hammer out a hostage release deal. It seems like that won't affect Israel's plans for Rafa. Yeah, you could have a ceasefire for even six weeks. We just don't know where hostages are released. And we want every hostage home, obviously. But when those six weeks are up, here's my point. Israel is going to pick up right where it left off. It's going to finish the job in Rafa, whether the world likes it, whether the world continues to howl and gnash its teeth or not, Israel's going to finish the job. We'll talk about that a bit more. And lastly, Israel blasting China. Interesting development here, folks. We've talked a bunch, obviously, over the months, really over the years here in the newscast about the Iran-Russia relationship, which, by the way, Late last week, news broke that Iran 
not only supplying Russia, Vladimir Putin's regime, with drones, which Putin has used to great effect on the battlefields of Ukraine, but also supplying Russia now with ballistic missiles, hundreds of them at last count. Talk about escalations. And an escalation in that relationship, that full-blown alliance between Russia and the Iranian regime. But Iran and China, a 25-year cooperation deal, which should really make it no surprise, I suppose, that China, the communist regime in Beijing, is defending the Palestinian right to attack Israel. Folks, I'm not kidding. And remember, China never condemned October 7th, nor did Russia. Now Israel is responding to China. You're going to hear about that as well, because the the, the great dragon in the Far East is stirring, and it will be stirring in the Middle East more and more, I believe, in the days to come. So needless to say, in case you haven't noticed, in case you're just joining us, Hey, we've got a lot to talk about. Now, let's keep the chat going. We've got thousands with us now. We'll have thousands more before we are through. We've got a very active chat going right now. Hey, I mentioned at the top of this newscast, I wasn't around with you live last week because I was on the road in Nashville, Tennessee, promoting the Stackelbeck Tonight show. Hey, if you love The Watchmen, you will love Stackelbeck Tonight, debuting March 25th on TBN. So we've got Stackelbeck Tonight. One last note, the Stacks cast. That's our brand new podcast, also a vodcast, Spotify, Apple, Mute, wherever you get your podcast, you will find the Stacks cast with Eric Stackelbeck. So now we've got three legs. Stackelbeck tonight coming to you nightly, March 25th. We've got the Watchmen here on the channel every day, and we've got once a week the Stacks cast podcast. Now, we debuted the podcast last week with my exclusive interview with the one and only Hulk Hogan wrestling legend you can catch it here on the channel we posted it here on the watchman channel last tuesday i believe that would be february 20th just check it out here in our archives under newscast you'll find it i strongly encourage you to check out my interview with hulk hogan the very first edition first episode of the stacks cast my brand new podcast hulk hogan sharing his christian testimony folks He's 70 years old. He was just baptized two months ago. It's an amazing story. And he, one of the most recognizable men in the world, and he unfolds his faith journey. Please check it out. It's an inspiring, encouraging story during a time we really need it. Now, that's episode one of the Stacks Cast. Episode two, debuting tomorrow, Sage Steele, former ESPN anchor, one of their top sportscasters, anchors, she left ESPN because of cancel culture. That's right. She is a conservative voice in left-wing sports media, or at least she was. She parted ways with ESPN, but not before suing ESPN's parent company, Disney. You're going to want to hear about this, folks, for infringing upon her freedom of expression, essentially. She expressed conservative views. Imagine that in the mainstream media. Great interview tomorrow with Sage Deal. So that's coming on the podcast as well. So, Hey, we've got a lot of programming coming to you for such a time as this. And remember, this is all from a bold, biblical keyword there, ladies and gentlemen, biblical perspective, unapologetically. What does the Bible say about it? That's where our conversation starts and where our conversation ends. So we'll be coming to you with that kind of biblically correct, politically incorrect, someone once said, but biblic biblically correct and hopefully prophetically correct programming here on The Watchman, on Stackelbeck Tonight, and the Stacks Cast. Exciting times here, and we just thank God uh, for expanding our territory, giving us a platform in a time where we believe it's sorely needed, voices for truth in a time of what seems to be at times universal deceit, uh, and no more so than in the Middle East right now, where Israel, as we get into really the crux of today's newscast, Israel, which was brutally attacked on October 7th, is now being pointed at as the victim. And we'll talk about China and, and the shameful comments from that communist regime about Israel. But up first, Hezbollah. You see the title, the thumbnail of today's newscast. Let's just pull it up and dig into it. Hezbollah today, folks, fired a barrage of 60 rockets 
at Israel's Golan Heights. Now, let me just preface this by saying I love the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights is a beautiful region uh, in Israel's north along the Syria border. I had a good friend of mine who recently moved from Jerusalem to the Golan. He said, the Golan's just so beautiful. It was calling to me, the, the God's creation there. It's, it's mountainous. It's beautiful. Oh, my Lord. Especially at this time of year in the spring, it's amazing. So let me preface it by saying that. Secondly, Syria, the Assad regime, says that the Golan Heights is theirs. They've been saying that for years and years. It's sovereign Israeli territory recognized as such by, excuse me, by President Trump in, I believe it was 2019 or 20, 2019 or 2020. He said, look, the Golan belongs to Israel. That has not stopped the Assad regime. And by extension, it's guests, the Iranian regime and Hezbollah from coveting the Golan Heights and continuously targeting it, cross-border attacks. Now, this time we had Hezbollah attacking 60 rockets. Let's read a little bit more, folks, from the Times of Israel. 60 Katusha rockets fired from Lebanon at the Golan Heights. Hezbollah said the rocket volley was in response to Israeli strikes in eastern Lebanon, which were the deepest confirmed Israeli attacks since the beginning of the cross-border clashes. This began, folks, on October 8th, those cross-border clashes. The day after the October 7th massacre, Hezbollah, not Israel, Hezbollah began launching rockets into Israel. Do you notice a pattern here? On October 7th, the day before, Hamas, not Israel, launched a war. Israel was attacked, unprovoked. October 8th, once again, Israel was attacked by Hezbollah to the north, unprovoked. Israel here, I could say victim, but Israel's anything but a victim because Israel's striking back and striking back hard. But nonetheless, I talked about universal deceit and a world turned upside down. The prophet Isaiah described it very rightly, the times we're living in where good is called evil and evil is called good. Those are the times we're in, folks. Israel was attacked in the south and the north. But I digress. The world has a short memory. Hezbollah says a target, I'm just quoting it, reading here from my phone verbatim from the Times of Israel. Hezbollah said it targeted an Israeli military base in the Golan Heights, quote, in response to the Zionist aggression near the city of Baalbek, which is about 62 miles north of the Israel-Lebanon border, northeast. That, folks, that is a deep, deep strike by Israel. Generally, since October 8th, Israel has been hitting Hezbollah and hitting them hard in the vicinity of that Israel-Lebanon border, but usually within 20 miles of the border. These were the deepest strikes yet, 62 miles in within Lebanese territory. Footage circulating on social media shows several rockets, Hezbollah rockets, impacting and exploding near a bus carrying passengers in, in the Golan who quickly disembarked to take cover. Thank God there were no reports of injuries in the barrage. Now, folks, look, I've been on buses like the one that just dodged those rockets in the Golan Heights many, many times. As I said, it's it's the high ground. It's a mountainous region. You go in a bus or a van, you go up, up, up to the type of the goal, top of the Golan Heights, and you're looking out from the Golan Heights. You can see straight into, into Syria, almost to Damascus on a clear day. And you can see, obviously, down uh, over the Galilee, whoever holds the Golan Heights holds the strategic high ground. And many said when President Trump, 2019, 2020, recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golan, many believed it was almost as important as his recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, chiefly because the Golan is such a strategic area geographically. Whoever holds the Golan essentially wins that any future conflict in the north. Thankfully, Israel holds it, but it is a persistent target. So 60 rockets, no one injured or killed, thank God that we know of. Seems like the folks in the bus just dodged, uh, not a bullet, dodged a rocket or, or several of them. Now, at the same time, Hezbollah, and we've got other news here, 
that's pretty major. Hezbollah shot down an Israeli drone. And by the way, some 218 Hezbollah members have been killed by Israel since October 8th and these ongoing, the Times of Israel calls it skirmishes. It's much more than that, folks. You saw my reporting from Northern Israel just two weeks ago along that Lebanon border. It ain't skirmishes. This is this is a full-blown second front. Gaza is the first front. The second front is open. It's not open all the way, but it's opening more and more. It's not a crack either. It's opening more and more every day. 60 rockets today? 60 at the Golan? Hezbollah shooting down an Israeli drone? And what about this? This is what Hezbollah says the rocket barrage was in response to. And by the way, Hezbollah says 218 Hezbollah members. The folks I spoke to on the ground when I was in northern Israel two weeks ago said they believe it's more than that. But here's what Hezbollah said it was responding to. Israel eliminated a senior Hezbollah commander named Hassan Hussein Salami in an airstrike in southern Lebanon. No relation to Salami from uh, Iran, Hossein Salami from is Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, who we've talked about here in the past. This is a different Salami, Hassan Hussein Salami, whose rank was equivalent to a brigade commander, was targeted while driving in a southern Lebanon village. And he is no more. The IDF said Salami was the commander of a regional unit in Hezbollah and oversaw attacks on IDF troops and Israeli communities in northern Israel. Other than that, he was a perfectly nice guy, I'm sure. Or not. Recent actions that Salami was involved in included anti-tank missile attacks on Kiryat Shimona, a beautiful Israeli town in the north, and on the base of Israel's 769th Regional Brigade, Brigade, according to the IDF, Hezbollah confirmed his death. Hey, of those, and they respond with the 60 Katusha rockets. Uh, they're saying it's, it's Zionist aggression, blah, blah, blah. The typical Hezbollah rhetoric. But listen, of those 218, again, I believe that number is higher, Hezbollah terrorists who've been killed since October 8th, since, again, Hezbollah attacked Israel, not the other way around. These are Israeli responses to Hezbollah aggression. Israel's invasion of Gaza was a response to Hamas launching October 7th and butchering 1,200 people. But, hey, a good number of folks of those deceased Hezbollah terrorists seem to have been commanders were people of a reasonably high rank. So it's interesting, it seems to me, that the IDF and Israeli intelligence really have pinpoint intelligence. Uh, and I've said this before, but in southern Lebanon, they seem to have just made great strides in identifying, I mean, not only Hezbollah operatives, but hey, think about that strike uh, in uh, where Sali al in January, early January, was killed in Beirut. The the top Hamas chieftain, terror master, was taken out. So the IDF really has a stunning track record of success in Lebanon and Syria in terms of taking out high-value targets. And foot soldiers are one thing, and they do a lot of damage. But these are strategic planners and commanders and masterminds that Israel is eliminating in the north. Hey, in the south, many commanders, brigade commanders have been eliminated, Hamas commanders as well, but it seems not to the level perhaps yet of the success Israel has had in targeting leadership in the north of Hezbollah. Of course, Yahya Sinwar, presumably, uh, Hamas's leader in Gaza is still alive, but as we transition here real quick, we're mentioning the south. I mentioned at the top here of the newscast 
Listen, Benjamin Netanyahu says that Rafa offensive is coming, whether the world likes it or not. And after that, after we crush Hamas's remaining brigades in Rafa, I believe there's six left. 18 of the 24 Hamas brigades have been eliminated since October 7th. And by the way, I, I just think that Hamas completely and utterly and fatally underestimated Israel's response to October 7th. Did they really think they were just going to get a slap on the wrist after carrying out the most heinous slaughter of the Jewish people since the Holocaust? Apparently they did. I do not believe that Hamas believed it would be in the position it finds itself in now, where literally, literally Rafa is its last stand. Hamas is down to its last stand. Gaza City, Khan Yunus, taken over by the IDF pacified largely by the IDF, still pockets of resistance, no doubt, in central and north Gaza and in southern Gaza, but largely the IDF has it under control. And to me, in less than four months, that's a massive accomplishment, massive strides under completely trying and extraordinary circumstances where Hamas uses civilian shields willfully as an integral part of its war strategy. I don't know that any invading army has ever dealt with it to this extent. I mean, Iraq, of course, Afghanistan, U.S. soldiers had to deal with it. But folks, this is so widespread. Not only Hamas embedded in every facet of Gazan civilian life, but Hamas using civilians as human shields. I mean, rocket launchers in schools, playgrounds, hospitals, entire terrorist apparatus and infrastructure beneath hospitals. There's never been anything like this. Just a, a region, a densely packed area, the Gaza Strip, that has been completely given over to terror by its terror masters, Hamas. There, there's, it seems, barely any stretch of Hamas, or I'm sorry, of Gaza, which has not been built up by Hamas and, by the way, by Islamic Jihad, the other Iranian proxy operating there, into a complete terror haven. Folks, imagine this. Imagine your every waking moment, literally your every waking moment for years on end, being spent building terror tunnels been all throughout Gaza, beneath the ground, deep beneath the ground, where the rats burrow in. Your whole life has been devoted to that. You've taken billions of dollars in international aid that should be going to women, children, the elderly, to feed people, to feed kids, give them food, shelter, clothing. You're stealing that money. And you are redirecting it, redirecting, redirecting it, apologies, to a murder machine. Tunnels, rockets, and the rest. How evil, diabolical, and wicked can you be? And just demonic. That's the word where I'm talking about Hamas, October 7th. The only word you can use is demonic. There's no other way to put it. The complete savagery, the gleeful butchery recorded by Hamas on their own cell phones and on GoPro cameras. Gleefully laughing. The one Hamas terrorist we highlighted, or should I say lowlighted, here on the newscast a few months ago, literally calling his parents in, in just... A rapturous glee and saying, Mom, Dad, I killed 10 Jews. And the mother and father praised him and said, Son, we're so proud of you. You killed 10 Jews. That was October 7th. That was demonic, evil from the pit of hell. And it must be crushed. Thankfully, the IDF's well on its way to doing just that. But I believe, folks, in years to come, I don't know how many years to come because I believe time is short. But this Israeli operation in Gaza, this war will be studied. People will take a step back. People who are sane will take a step back and say, Israel, how did you do it? I mean, you uprooted an entire terrorist stronghold. Miles and miles and miles. You did it with minimal Israeli casualties, and by the way, minimal Palestinian casualties. Why do I say that? You might say, wait, but the, the Palestinian health ministry says 30,000 Palestinians have been killed. Who runs the Palestinian health ministry, ladies and gentlemen? Hamas. 
So pardon me if I take that with a grain of salt, what Hamas says, Hamas's numbers. And we see the mainstream media here in the West and Western diplomats regurgitating Hamas's numbers. I don't know, maybe Hamas inflated the numbers a bit to make Israel look bad. Is that possible? Or are we going to take what Hamas says at face value? Apparently, the mainstream media is. And Western diplomats and decision makers and the EU and the UN and the Biden administration. By the way, say it is 30,000. Any civilian death is heinous, horrible, and horrific. If it is 30,000, and it very likely obviously is not, when Hamas is sharing the numbers and coming up with the numbers and tabulating the numbers. But who does responsibility for those deaths ultimately lie with? Does it lie with Hamas, which launched this war unprovoked and which willfully uses these unfortunate people as human shields, uses their homes, businesses, hospitals, schools, and playgrounds to launch rockets, intentionally positions rocket launchers around civilian targets? The IDF has extraordinary rules of engagement where they go to painstaking lengths to avoid any civilian casualties. We've covered this on many newscasts previously over the months. But also keep in mind, no matter what the number is, the IDF says, at least 10,000 Hamas terrorists have been killed. So if the number's 30, if it's 20, know that 10,000 of whatever the number is are not civilians. They were Hamas terrorists, combatants in the war against Israel. But the Palestinian slash Hamas Health Ministry doesn't see that, doesn't deem that fit to report in its numbers. It doesn't make that specification. There's no asterisk next to that number. Interesting how that works and how the mainstream media swallows it hook, line, and sinker. But that's where we're at, folks, in Gaza. The two fronts we've covered, Hezbollah, Hamas, we need now. I want to close with China. But real quick, I mentioned about the Houthis. Now, the Houthis, things have been not quiet. Needless to say, in Yemen, I wish I could say that, but they haven't been. Here's the latest. The Houthis, according to a report, where's the report from? From an Israeli news site called Globes. The Houthis have knocked out underwater cables linking Europe to Asia. The successful targeting of the four cables marks a serious disruption of communications between Europe and Asia, says the Jerusalem Post. Four underwater communications cables between Saudi Arabia and Djibouti have been struck out of commission in recent months, presumably as a result of attacks by Yemen's Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. This is insane. Most of the immediate harm of this will be absorbed by the Gulf states and India. One of the cables connects East Asia to Europe via Egypt, connecting China to the West. Then Europe and Africa and India connected through these underwater cables. Folks, this is insane. It's insane, number one. If you're Houthi, the Houthis, it's perfectly sane in your view. That's not what I'm saying. It's insane because it's being allowed to happen. It's insanity on the part of the West. Why is this being, why is this continuing? Why is this being permitted to happen? For months now, the Houthis, this band of brigands and terrorists backed by the Iranian regime, has been permitted to wreak absolute havoc in the Red Sea region. And now underwater cables having a global economic impact here? And you might say, what do you mean? Uh, The U.S. and U.K. have carried out airstrikes. Yeah, I know. Clearly, they're not doing enough, and they're not hitting the right targets, and you're not hitting the Houthis where it hurts. It's one thing to target Houthi rocket launchers. It's another thing to target the people who are actually launching the rockets, the people behind the rocket launchers, and Houthi leaders. I'm not saying boots on the ground. All those special forces, a small contingent, a Commando raid, maybe something like that in Yemen. Uh, Something. Because this has to stop. It's insanity that it took week upon week for the West to finally respond. 
after Maersk and BP said, hey, we're not going to use the Red Sea. We're going to get bombed or hijacked by the Houthis. What a show of weakness by the West. And, you know, the first thing Joe Biden did when he came into office in January 2021 was, you guessed it, remove the Houthis from the U.S. terror, terror list, designated, specially designated global terrorist organizations, throwing a bone to the Iranian regime, saying to Iran, hey, we're removing the Houthis. We're trying to throw you a bone here. Now do business with us, Iran. Let's make a deal, a grand bargain. And Iran, here's what we want. We just want you to leave us alone and be nice. We'll give you whatever you want. We'll remove the Houthis from the terror list. We'll give you billions of dollars in sanctions relief. Please, mullahs in Tehran, just stop attacking us and be nice. This is the quintessential example of appeasement for our times. The, the U.S. and Europe, the complete appeasement of the Iranian regime. It's really quite disgraceful. And now the insanity is expanding. And the Houthis aren't paying the kind of consequences that they need to pay. Again, I'm not, you might say, warmonger. No, I'm not talking about a full scale invasion of Yemen. What I am talking about is taking appropriate steps to send a message to the Houthis where they don't do this anymore, where they don't dare do this anymore. Because you might say, now, well, you're calling for a war. No, but I'll tell you what. Everyone watching right now, and anyone who thinks I'm being unreasonable, once it starts hitting you in your wallet, in your pocketbook, all of a sudden you might take more of a hard line against the Houthis and say, hey, we need to do something about these guys. Because I'll tell you right now, it's going to start hurting everyone. Underwater communication cables, linking continents and in trade, presumably. Uh, ships, major companies like BP and Maersk bypassing the Red Sea because they're afraid of the Houthis. A good chunk of the world's commerce and energy goes through the Red Sea every day. All of a sudden, there are supply chain issues. Wow. So everyone who's saying, ah, the Houthis, whatever, and shrugging their shoulders right now might have a different stance in the not-too-distant future if this madness continues. This should have been dealt with decisively in November. It's been allowed to fester now. And yes, Houthi targets, rocket launchers, etc., have been hit. But from what I can gather, the entire Houthi command and control structure, their leadership is still going at it and boasting and making threats. I I'm just exasperated by it. You can probably hear in the tone of my voice. I'm completely exasperated. This could be dealt with in one day. Think back. I've a few times I've said it. 1986. I know it's a long time ago, but not too long to remember the message that was sent 38 years ago when Ronald Reagan, a man who coined the term essentially in the modern age, peace through strength, struck Muammar Gaddafi's Libya. Gaddafi didn't rear his head again for about 20 years, maybe in less than 20. I, I apologize, but it, Gaddafi was never quite the same. And certainly his terror against the U.S. was never quite the same. Message sent. Qasem Soleimani, 2020, message sent. Houthis, 2024, message not sent, not received. And it, it hasn't computed. So the Biden administration and Europe need to go back to the drawing board here. Will they? Because, folks, listen, if they do that, it'll make Iran mad. That is why you're seeing half measures against the Houthis, because, oh, my word, if we do that, if we hit the Houthis hard, well, mm, they're an Iranian proxy. They're funded, supplied by Iran and cheered on by Iran and directed by Iran. If we hurt them, that might make Iran mad. And then we can't have a grand bargain and a brand new nuclear deal with the Iranian regime. This is the calculus of Western leaders. Last thing as we close, China. I just leave you with this. and Let's expand on this next time, folks, but hear me out on this. I think it's significant. 
And I think it's a harbinger of things to come. From the times of Israel, Israel slams China for telling the world court that Palestinians have the right to use of force. China presented this to the International Court of Justice. It said Palestinians' use of force, meaning attacking Israel, is legitimate. It's a legitimate tool for achieving Palestinian independence. So China is essentially defending Palestinian terror in a world court, and Israel blasted them in response. China should ask itself why the terrorist organization Hamas was quick to welcome the words of China at the International Court of Justice. Keep an eye on this. Because listen, folks, China is all in with Iran as well. And I think Israel is in a very precarious position where, look, Russia and China are aligned. They're all in with your greatest enemy, the Iranian regime. Where does that leave Israel vis-a-vis -vis these two countries, China and Russia? You do the math. Common sense in times where common sense is not so common. Let's keep an eye on these China developments. We certainly will hear on the live stream. Hey, reminder, tomorrow, episode two of my brand new podcast, The Stacks Cast. Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to your podcast, and we will post it here in the channel as well. Sage Steele, former ESPN anchor, incredible story of how she escaped cancel culture, essentially, as a bold conservative voice, and she won in a court of law against the left-wing cancelers. She was uncanceled. You're going to want to hear this posted tomorrow on the channel. If you missed last week's StackCast, the one and only Hulk Hogan, that was Tuesday, February 20th. It's right here in our archives under newscasts. While you're there, be sure to subscribe. Click the notification bell. Great being back with you. Great way to start the week here, Monday, and much more to come the rest of the week. Thanks so much for joining us here in The Watchman. Until tomorrow, God bless you, and remember, never hold your peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out The Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload, and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back.